Well, Bill, that was a wonderful summary of a great deal of information and a lot of activity that you have been personally responsible for in just remarkable ways. So it's a real privilege for all of us to have you here at the American Society of Human Genetics and for me to be able to be your inquisitor for the next half hour or so, after which two other inquisitors will turn up. No, actually, it's a friendly group. Don't worry. <laughs> And I think we have also now started broadcasting this live on Facebook. So whatever happens here will be kept uh, in posterity. So try not to flub it too badly. Um, there, there, there are a few people who have once uh, suggested to me that perhaps because of our physical resemblance that you and I are the same person. But I hope all of you who are here today can put uh, paid to that rumor because unless one of us is a hologram, we are clearly not the same person, but it's an honor to be considered in such a way. So I guess um, let's start with HIV because here we have this incredible pandemic, which we've known about now for 37 years or thereabouts, and which clearly has been in the human population longer than that and which uh, we have made, first of all, significant strides. Uh, today, someone who is born in a country that has access to antiretroviral uh, vaccines and it turns out to be HIV positive at, say, age 21, has almost a normal life expectancy. And some of the younger folks in the audience who were not here in the late 80s and early 90s uh, may think that it's always been that way, but it was certainly at that time a death sentence. So great progress there. And we've learned other things that have been particularly encouraging in terms of how we can, by driving viral loads uh, down to very low levels, uh, essentially reduce the transmission as well. But as Tony Fauci wrote about in a uh, JAMA article just a week or so ago, uh, the idea that we could actually end the HIV pandemic, that we could in fact usher in an AIDS-free generation seems very difficult to achieve, maybe even impossible, without a vaccine. I, I think the, the, the challenges of trying to achieve that in resource-poor countries, or in other countries for that matter, without the vaccine seem almost insurmountable. Uh, so first of all, do you agree with that? And second of all, how are we doing on the HIV vaccine strategy? Because uh, there's a lot of activity here. Are you optimistic that we are on a glide path towards success? Well, the HIV story, as you say, is definitely a glass half full. We don't yet have the magical tools uh, that we want. And yet, uh, in rich countries, the IV treatments are amazing. Uh, you know, the, the innovation there has given us uh, a, a lot of really good solutions. And the drugs are priced at less than $100 a year. So that access, uh, although it started out not... Uh, being great. Now it's uh, gotten to a, a really great place. And this is an area where U.S. generosity is, is pretty amazing. PEPFAR. Uh, the PEPFAR program, uh, plus the U.S. Uh, portion of Global Fund, has the U.S. government spent over $6 billion a year uh, keeping over 10 million people alive because of access to these ARB drugs. Mm -hmm. And the challenge is that until we get a very good preventative tool, which a vaccine is likely the only thing that'll uh, really uh, fulfill that, the, uh, the disease is just being held in status. That is, the population growth in this 16 to 24-year-old age group in the African countries where, unfortunately, most of the epidemic is, you have so much population growth that we're not, we're not really cutting the in infection rate with all these interventions that we've had. And so it's just staying the same. If the money's cut, unfortunately, we will go back up to the peak, which was back in 2006. Mm. And so we've got to keep doing a better job with the tools we have today. And there's a lot of innovative things that PEPFAR's doing around that, about getting out to young women and getting them to uh, uh, protect them, uh, change their behavior so that they're uh, less likely to get the disease. But without a vaccine, the numbers won't, won't change dramatically. And uh, there's many vaccine leads. I mean, the amount we've learned about the immune system, uh, because this is a diseased immune system, I think is pretty phenomenal. It is. You know, learning about antibodies. And uh, there are many paths that are, look promising. I mentioned one called uh, CMV. Uh, there's a 
add 26 uh, vector-based approach that looks uh, very promising. And there's, there's three or four others. And so I'm optimistic that there's a good chance that in the next decade we could have such a tool. There's no guarantee, and it certainly won't be you know, in the next six or seven years. How good does it have to be? We, right now we have the 702 trial that's underway in South Africa, which is uh, trying to take what was the first actual signal of some response, which is a lot different than having no signal of response from, from the RV144 trial, and now bring that forward with a new adjuvant and some other boosts and all that. Uh, do you think it's going to work? We won't know for a couple of years. Well, uh, you know, you and, I, and, and your organization, NIH, and uh, mine, Gates Foundation, are two of the big funders yeah, of, we're, of we're that. Yeah, we're back. We so are indeed. The, there's two potential benefits to that work. One is if it got to like a, a 50% effect, then it would be a tool that we would want to deploy. Uh, that's the best case. The second case is that it really confirms the hints about the biology that were in that earlier trial. And so that we were really laying a roadmap out for, okay, what should the antigen look like? You know, the end antigen done a certain way that is, is way better than uh, other, other antigens. And so it's a very important trial. Like all these things, it ta always takes a little bit longer than I wish it would to get yeah, it going, to get people enrolled <laughs> in those things. So it's, it's fantastic that now we have that underway. The other candidates are you know, maybe three years behind uh, that at best. And what about broadly neutralizing antibodies? This seems like it's such an exciting opportunity to discover there are people who spontaneously produce these a little too late for it to be helpful to them in terms of fighting off the disease. But clearly they're making antibodies that look as if they would neutralize a vast percentage of HIV genomes that are around there. Uh, and why can't we just come up with a vaccine that causes all of us to make one of those and get it done with? And then we'd be all where we need to be. Yeah, the quality of these antibodies uh, both the ones that have been isolated in humans and now in things like cows. Uh, these are incredible antibodies. So that insight, you can think of three ways that could get out to have an impact. One is that the antibodies could be cheap enough and have a long enough half-life that you could do passive immunization. Sure. That looks to be tough, but there are people looking at, at that. A second is uh, some incredible people uh, that include Scripps and many other uh, groups, that, including NIH, is to actually figure out how you elicit those antibodies. And because they're highly hypermutated antibodies, getting the immune system to go down the right path, sort of in, independent of your immune type, it's a wonderful scientific problem, and they are making progress. But you uh, can't do it in one step. You no, know, it's, it's a multi-step thing. and, and Take and the so, immune system to graduate school here? Is that kind of what you're right. trying to do? Yeah. Uh, and a third approach, uh, which you know, may be the wildest of all, is an antibody factory where you would you know, give somebody AAV into muscle and then it would be generating the antibody. But understanding all the safety issues about that, how, how you'd get uh, that pushed through, that's partly why uh, the... Uh, genetic editing, you know, the, whether it's the rare diseases or sickle cell disease, the fact that the genetic editing tools are being worked on uh, and, you know, still lots of tough, tough problems. Yeah. But that has a lot of promise, uh, as we were talking to the sickle cell disease people about what the profile for gene editing they would need. Uh, it was interesting that uh, it, there's a lot in common of what you would need to uh, do an, an HIV type cure yes. uh, using those tools. So, you know, it's, it's not imminent, but, you know, the work that's being driven uh, uh, has, has that potential. What do you see right now as the greatest biological threat uh, to our world? Is it something we've already talked about? Well, if you model pandemics, the fact that people move around so much more today than they, they did in 1918 uh, means that you know, a flu, which you know, call that 30% of the pandemic risk is, is a specific pathogen that we actually know pretty well, the rate at which it would spread uh, would be phenomenal. And society's very into 
in, dependent on supply chains, uh, you know, uh, highways, communication systems aren't designed for the type of panic and desire to move that would uh, result. And so I'm, I'm not saying it's very likely, but I do feel the world is, is quite underprepared for that. Mm -hmm. And I'm hopeful that uh, some of these tools will eventually uh, give us the ability to have the kind of quick response that you'd want against that. So, or, or a universal flu vaccine where you don't have to have a quick response because well, be, everybody's already immune. That would be ideal. Uh, in fact, a number of studies we've done have shown that flu, uh, a mother getting flu uh, during uh, pregnancy has a significant effect on uh, birth weight and therefore on uh, what happens with that child. Now, these are in equatorial regions, so until we get a, a using the flu vaccine doesn't really work that well in the equatorial regions because you don't get this lead time like we do in the, the northern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. But a universal flu vaccine, I think, would be brilliant because it would reduce pandemic risk. I also think the human health benefit would be larger, uh, particularly in developing countries, than, than we'd expect. So many people looking at the epidemiology uh, would point out that the fastest growing area of morbidity and mortality in low and middle income countries is now the non-communicable diseases, uh, things which maybe you could say were adopted by Western lifestyles becoming more prominent, uh, diabetes, heart disease, obesity, and cancer. That seems in many ways uh, to be a surprise uh, to some people, and it certainly doesn't seem that we have at the moment a worldwide sort of organized idea about how to approach those issues the way that we have, at least to some degree, with infectious disease. Obviously, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, thinking about global health and about every life having equal value, must also be thinking about where to go with those, even though that's not been the area of main focus. What are your thoughts on NCDs? Yeah, I'd say that uh, I'd encourage everybody to go to this uh, IHME, Inter International Health Metrics and Evaluation. It's an institute that's under the University of Washington uh, where Chris Murray and the team he's built track yeah. the global burden of disease. Uh, and it's got great interactive tools where you can sit and see by country, by time period, you know, by gender, uh, uh, not only the direct uh, causes of death, but the disability and this idea that chronic diseases are the biggest growing problem is super evident in rich countries, but it's absolutely true that in India they have as much chronic disease burden as infection. They're right at that kind of crossover point where unfortunately they have serious issues still in infectious, but already right. very serious issues uh, in chronic disease, including uh, diabetes. And so the world is going to have to be very innovative. The unique role that we think of our foundation having is health equity. So when the rich world comes up, say, with an HPV vaccine, uh, which you know, for cervical cancer works very well, uh, or hep B for uh, a type of, of liver cancer, then it's really our role to make sure it gets cost reduced and made available worldwide. And you know, so we need great breakthroughs for Alzheimer's and diabetes. Uh, heart disease is a fascinating one where uh, Tom Frieden, who was the head of the CDC, came to us uh, when he finished that job and said he wanted to take on some what are now low-cost blood pressure control tools and other things related to heart disease Salt, for and get those things out into the, the developing world. And so uh, Michael Bloomberg, uh, Chan Zuckerberg, and our foundation funded Tom, who's been a, a great partner in all sorts of things to go really now take heart disease uh, and and show us how we can uh, get total health equity there. Likewise, tobacco sensation is one that we've been uh, very involved in. Uh, you know, now trying to figure out uh, where e-cigarettes and uh, warm tobacco should fit into that that effort. So. This is an audience, obviously, that's particularly focused on the science of genetics, which has made remarkable advances technologically and in terms of applications uh, to medicine, maybe particularly, one could say, in cancer and also in birth defects. And this is also a very international audience. Uh, many of the people here are not uh, from the United States. 
And I think all of us who have a sense of the importance of global health, which uh, you of all people I think have been such a beacon for the importance of, would like to make sure that our science uh, of genetics and genomics is also finding its way into those places uh, where it could be clearly providing a benefit. We talked about that this afternoon about sickle cell disease since the vast majority of people with that condition do not live uh, in the developed countries, but they live in Africa and India. But there are other areas as well. Cancer, uh, where uh, clearly the opportunity to have cancer genomics tools associated with some choice about therapeutics could begin to be pretty valuable as well. And yet the barriers are pretty substantial. I don't have to tell you in terms of that kind of technology uh, being exported uh, to circumstances where there's not a lot of infrastructure. Many of us dream, though, about that changing. And we could look at many of these countries and say, while they're still struggling, at least they are on some sort of a positive trajectory. Many of them are, not all, uh, in terms of their GDP beginning to, uh, to take an upward swing. If we could sort of look forward o- over a decade or two, what's the path that we ought to try to get on so that if we were having this discussion in 2037, it would look different and there would be more empowerment uh, of the places where such benefits could be achieved, but which at the present time are not really situated to be able to embrace them. Yeah, when we think about different countries, uh, it's probably best nowadays to put them into three buckets. In the 1960s, it really was the developed world and what was nicely called the developing world, which meant the poor world. Uh, Today, the good news is that most of humanity lives in the middle-income countries. Uh, So, you know, China, Brazil, India is kind of on the boundary. Uh, And then we still have have some very poor countries. Those middle-income countries are in some ways for health the most interesting places because they can't afford to do health like we've done. Mm -hmm. Uh, As we've discussed, their disease burdens are every bit as challenging uh, in a few cases, like uh, obesity and diabetes, it you know looks like there's even some genetic uh, predilection that will make it yeah. uh, even tougher for them. And so they are going to be looking for effective solutions. And in some ways, they'll, they'll be less conservative, uh, and that could lead to some mistakes. But they really need, uh, with aging populations and uh, that chronic disease burden, they will need to adopt innovative technologies. Mm -hmm. So I'm hopeful we don't get off down the path we got with genetically modified organisms where there's a a backlash and a fear and a a lack of understanding because the potential human health benefit uh, for those middle-income countries, if these tools can be made uh, a fairly low cost, is just really mind-blowing. And... You know, I, I'm, I'm personally very optimistic about those things, but how we tailor these solutions, eventually see approaches that are not 300,000 per year uh, type things, that even the U.S. Uh, is going to have a heck of a time affording uh, you know, that, that type of cost. It's just, it's, it, it's great, and you know, uh, I'm a huge believer that the U.S. does the world an incredible favor by having its medical market fund, well, between the the, uh, taxpayer generosity for funding the research, which is phenomenal, and the uh, market funding the the private companies, we do an amazing job for the world. But it means that the particular profile they're going to need, uh, including uh, that, that cost profile, that's a huge, huge challenge for us. Indeed. Let's ask, I want to ask you a little bit about education. It was uh, a lot of fun this afternoon being part of these sessions that were put together by ASHG uh, to talk about topics that you've mentioned, epigenomics and sickle cell disease and something about population genetics. And uh, clearly you are somebody uh, who is focused in about as intense a way as I've seen in anybody about learning new things, about trying to fill out all kinds of areas of science and medicine and, and public policy and public health that are relevant uh, to your mission. And at the end of the epigenomics session, I think you said it again here, it it was clearly really complicated and you got a good sense of what the complications are, but you thought, I need to go and find out more about this and I'll go and find an online course, you said. So 
Everybody in this audience needs to be doing that same kind of thing on all kinds of topics that we don't necessarily know enough about. So how do you do that? Uh, teach this group here about how uh, you do your continuing education. How do you find the good stuff uh, in the time you've got available to fill your brain with all the information that you seem so familiar with? Well, it's, this is the best time to be alive in terms of learning new things. Yeah. Uh, whether it's you know, reminding myself how to compute correlations so I can help my son with his statistics class or <laughs> uh, you know, learning enough meteorology so I understand hurricane severity and what, uh, uh -huh. why uh, that's going up with climate change. The number of great lectures that are out on the internet is unbelievable. I would say that the, the most straightforward thing uh, are, is going to the courses from the learning company because of their, they're of uniformly high quality. Mm -hmm. The economics courses, the history courses, uh, the science courses like the astronomy course, uh, they have the best uh, geology courses, the best meteorology courses, and they, they're taking the best university professors. And, you know, you kind of fall in love with these people because they're so good at explaining their things and they love the topic. Uh, that they're, they're working on. Uh, and then you can supplement that with other online materials. It, it is a time where, you know, they're, uh, you know like in physics, uh, the, the explanation there, that's a case where the web stuff um, is, is really quite phenomenal. And how about public education? You, you have put a lot of resources into trying to improve the state uh, of K through 12 education, and I can gather from some of the things I've seen that that's not been an easy task. And uh, we still have, I think, uh, lots of circumstances that are not that different than what turned you off about biology, where people spend their time dissecting worms instead of talking about really interesting principles of life. By the way, that's what turned me off to biology and sent me into chemistry and physics for a few years before I came back and realized that I'd missed out on the really good stuff. But I think the really good stuff is still maybe a little hard to find in an awful lot of curricula. And as a result, we still have serious problems in this country just in terms of literacy about science and particularly about biology. And um, how, how are we doing in terms of trying out creative ideas, which I know your foundation has pr put forward, to try to see if we could turn this around? What do we need to do to get our country, which ought to be, you know, really performing well here, out of the basement from where we currently are as you assess what 15-year-olds know about science? Yeah, the U.S. is a paradox. Uh, we still have, by far, the leading universities and, you know, the scientific knowledge that's coming out of that to benefit the world is just incredible. And yes, you know, the UK, the rest of Europe, China see that they're doing some of those things. But the U.S. lead, whether it's in biology or uh, computer science or, or many other fields, so those, those two in particular, is, is an incredible thing. But if you look at how we're educating the population, uh, high school dropouts, uh, math scores, reading and writing scores, we're actually getting a little bit worse even as we spend a higher percentage of GDP on education. And a lot of that is the contrast between the inner city schools and the suburban schools. Uh, the suburban schools, if you just took those by themselves, or the best charter schools or the private schools, the U.S. is every bit as good as the other exemplars, which are mostly Asian. Uh, South Korea, Singapore, and China uh, are numbers one, two, and three. Uh, and if you just take the trends of some of these Asian countries, uh, you know, they're still uh, going up. Now, that's not to say that their system is perfect. Uh, there's a lot of rote learning. There's yeah. a lot of pressure. Uh, and so, and culturally, we're unlikely to mimic uh, all those things that they've done. But particularly in math and science, making sure high school teachers make those things interesting, uh, using the new personalized approaches that, that show a great deal of promise. And so I don't think the benefit of technology has yet uh, had an impact on schools. Yes, everybody can go look up Wikipedia. That's, that's super nice. But the idea of tracking which students are falling behind, giving them personalized learning that's interactive enough so that they can still feel a sense of progress and uh, get the, the special attention they need, 
That's still in front of us, and so I'm optimistic about that. But it is fair to say that in global health, our foundation uh, working with others can see dramatic impact, even beyond what we would have expected. Whereas in our US education work, uh, those overall countrywide numbers have not moved. So although you can go see a few public schools and a few charter schools doing some of these new things, that makes me hopeful that if we can scale that up, we will see dramatic improvement. It's still, uh, you know, still hard to know. Are you worried about anti-science sentiments in this country and whether they're getting worse instead of better? Yeah, I generally think things get better. Uh, so whenever people give me counterexamples, I think, <laughs> uh, uh, let me go study that. Uh, so I hope not because the, if you look at the jobs that the economy is generating, you know, we're a high cost economy. And so some understanding of science, even to be, you know, a, a high level nurse or, uh, you know, to work in a technology type job, you probably have to not only uh, have some understanding, but you have to have some fascination. You have to find it, it fairly interesting. And our high schools are currently making math and science sort of forbidding subjects that a lot of people shy away from. Yeah. Uh, and so the very way that math is taught or people are drawn into science, I do think there's room for creativity uh, in that. And it, it is important because our, the gap between where the jobs are going to be and how we're training people uh, is a, a very big gap. And so you get this disappointment that can create even in the political realm, sort of the sense of, okay, you, you let us down, uh, but it's very predictable unless we improve education that, that there is going to be that mismatch. So in a minute, we're going to bring uh, Nancy Cox and Pete Scaccheri up here. Before we do so, I guess, Bill, I just ask from your perspective with your very broad ability to survey across the whole landscape of what's happening in biological science and medicine uh, and global health, um, two things. What are you most excited about and what are you most worried about? Well, the, the progress is amazing. I mean, just take the microbiome. Oh my. Okay, maybe it won't cure everything. <laughs> uh, but it, if it does a tenth of the things that various startups <laughs> are working towards curing Alzheimer's, alone, diabetes, yeah, uh, depression, I heart mean, why disease, not? depression, uh, nutrition. Yeah. You know, we have a result that the risk per act of acquiring HIV varies by a factor of 10 depending on your vaginal microbiome. And so if we can intervene mm -hmm. in, and, and it turns out uh, Western women have more of the protective type, uh, over 70%, whereas in Africa, less than 20% have the protective type. And so if there is an intervention, uh, that can make a big difference. It won't end the disease, but it, it will really uh, knock the numbers down pretty incredible. And that's just one, you know, microbiome insight, which without, you know, sort of massive genetic uh, information, you know, what were we going to do? Just stick the bacteria under the microscope and watch them squiggle around? I mean, this, the numbers involved, and, you know, thank God the digital world is sort of giving us infinite storage and computation because... Uh, geneticists are one of the few people who can fill up those disks. And we're uh, doing it. <laughs> uh, so thank you for all of your data uh, that will allow these cloud computing facilities to grow with, with no end in sight. They have a great future uh, now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm, you know, I think we are getting fundamental insights. Uh, and if you put the brain aside where it's hard to predict the timing for a lot of key diseases, the next 15 years, I think, will be uh, pretty amazing. I hope the brain, Alzheimer's, uh, and other things get into that, but I think that one's a little harder to, pr uh, to predict, even though it's very important. I'd say my biggest concern is, is uh, that a lot of these things, whether it's policies about genetic editing or policies about climate change or uh, you know, sharing, having open data sets so that we can advance science as fast as possible, they really require a global perspective. Yeah. Um, even though the U.S. on its own is, is preeminent and, and amazing, the, the global cooperation 
including with the poor countries, developing their scientists, having them on site where they can see what, what needs to be done. And so anything that kind of threatens that sense of uh, you know, humanity working as a whole, uh, you know, doing things like the, the PEPFAR program to, to jump in, anything that threatens that, uh, I think, is, is very damaging uh, to, to what can be done. And uh, you know, it runs counter to my general optimism, so it, it puzzles me greatly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're puzzled, because I have a feeling when you're puzzled, something happens. So, <laughs> so let me invite Nancy Cox and Pete Scaccheri to come up and join this conversation, because uh, they are bringing with them questions that you all have submitted uh, over the web in the course of the last few days. And I'm sure, because uh, I don't know what they're going to ask us about, uh, we'll have an interesting next chapter in, in this uh, hour and a half conversation with Phil. Okay. All right, so I, I'm going to lead this off. Okay, um, Pete. You seem to have managed to have captured a lot of the questions that the audience already posed uh, to Phil. <laughs> so, uh, so we'll see how this goes. So the first question um, came from Barku Darst from the University of, of Wisconsin. The field of genetics has seen huge changes over the past 20 years, especially due to whole genome sequence te sequencing technologies. So now that we're all trying to become data scientists, what do you foresee as being the next big thing to change this field? So I'll pose this to either one of you. Francis, if you want to take this. Well, I'll start, um, but I'm sure Bill would have things to add to this. So I, I think we have to recognize, uh, as was just said, that we have become a major producer <laughs> of large data sets that are going to be of incredible value for understanding how life works and how disease occurs. And we should not limit our perspective about that just to germline genome sequences, although that is uh, obviously an area of great interest, but also all the other kinds of omics uh, that are going to be coming along. We, we heard the microbiome, and you can make a big data set with microbiome without hardly trying. Uh, and all of the things that one can do now uh, with circulating RNA, but whether it's free RNA or whether it's RNA-seq done on uh, peripheral uh, uh, blood mononuclear cells, uh, and certainly exosomes that carry around nucleic acids, all of these things which not only you would want to sample once, you'd want to sample those repeatedly and follow over the course of time what's happening to an individual as a window into their biology and perhaps into whether they're at risk for something or even starting to develop an illness. All of these omics uh, opportunities, and I should certainly say that's not just nucleic acids, that's metabolomics, that's proteomics, uh, those are going to be phenomenal opportunities. And we need to be sure that we are not missing the chance as those data sets are collected to put them in a place where lots of researchers can learn from them, compute on them. And those are going to be data sets that are much too big to sit in anybody's server. So it's not going to be on your server or mine. It's going to have to be in a place uh, where it can be uh, accessed. And that's going to have to be in the cloud. And that means we're going to really have to retool ourselves in terms of how we do those analyses. Because not just the data, but the analytics will have to be in the cloud as well. You're not going to be able to download all those petabytes uh, to your machine and work on it. It's not going to work that way. So it's a transformative opportunity, but it is also a responsibility that all of us who are generating those kinds of data sets think about how to make sure that they are sustainable and they're accessible and they're fair for everybody who has something they might want to learn from them. Uh, that's going to be true in human genetics. It's going to be true uh, in any area that uses human genetics, certainly including infectious disease. And the era where it is okay to basically sit on your own data set uh, for many years, uh, trying to mine it and then remine it and remine it again, that era is over. And I'm certainly speaking as the NIH director here. We now have uh, quite a lot of ways to encourage good behavior in this regard. Uh, some of which are, in fact, uh, less pleasant. Some of which are just that we've tried to provide appropriate incentives. Um, I've often said that trying to manage the research community, many people have concluded, is really like herding cats. And it is like herding cats, but guess what? I've got a big bag of cat food. It's called the NIH budget. <laughs> and if it's appropriately applied, it can actually encourage some pretty good things to happen. So anyway, but Bill, data access. <laughs> well, I'd say the next frontier, and this will show my bias as a software person, is to think of DNA as much more of a program than a, as a set of constants. Uh -huh. You know, as I sit and listen to people talking about, you know, this 
enhancer talks to this promoter that uh, you know loops around to touch this other thing. You know that's <laughs> that is software, uh, and so whether we can build these software models by hand or whether we have to just gather massive data and machine learn into this more symbolic software type approach, you know the the dynamics of what are going on to drive expression uh, will need uh, rich symbolic models, and so uh, you know once again the fields of, of of computer science and modeling in the field of genetics will have to have these polymathic people who know both of them uh, <laughs> take, take us to there. the next frontier. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just, just to follow up on that, I mean, Francis, you were talking about just generating these massive data sets, and that's showing no signs of slowing, right? We keep generating more and more data, Going up. And, uh, and we use you know, computers ubiquitously to, to find trends and meaning in that data and analyze that ge genetic variation. Um, but I think all of us are, are still struggling a bit, right? It's a huge amount of data. And you know, we, we're constantly looking for, I think, new um, uh, advances in computing that, that enable us to, to really find meaning in the data. Um, is there anything coming down the pike that's kind of going to help us out and, and help us to advance human health and disease with respect to technology advancements? I mean, is there AI coming? Is there, is there other things that we can, that we can uh, look forward to I think this is where I'm supposed to say machine learning and then Bill will say, no, wait a minute, that doesn't answer any questions unless you already have a lot of data. Do we have enough data to say that that's going to be the solution? I do think we'll get there. I mean, the idea of being able to look for patterns without having to know ahead of time even what you're looking for is enormously appealing. It's not so appealing when you get the answer but you don't know why and that's, that's a bit of a challenge about it. But I'm sitting next to somebody who really knows about this stuff. So yeah, what, what about it? Is AI going to solve all the problems in biology? Well, it's a tool. Uh, you know, did mathematics solve all the problems in physics? Sort of. Sort of. Uh, it's a pretty know. good framework. <laughs> you just couldn't solve the equation. Yeah, but. the Schrodinger equation <laughs> is a form of truth. So, you know, it thank is. God for mathematics. <laughs> uh, and so, yes, the tools of machine learning will be helpful to us. Right now in machine learning, the idea of taking symbolic understandable things and how those combine with these pure sort of data-driven, opaque, you know, 41 level vision system type system, the ability to explain and diagnose what's going on in those things, that's a very state-of-the-art problem. Uh, you know, to, you know, for example, if, if the machine is recognizing cats, to say, okay, what do you think a cat is? What characterizes a cat? That's a, a, a symbolic inquiry back into the machine learn thing. So the, there's a lot of progress that has to be made in that. Uh, it is stunning how quick the progress has been in the last six years versus the 20 years before that, yeah. that we, we reached a, a threshold of computing and understanding with the cloud techniques that will be uh, very, very key. Uh, but there's a lot to be done. I mean. You know, the, the paradigmatic problem that I like is give the computer a biology textbook and then give it a biology test. We don't know how to do that today. You can ask it what the words in the book were, uh, but in the sense of how you represent knowledge, we're nowhere. Vision and speech, which were viewed as paradigmatic problems, those are solved problems. We are better than humans and will continue uh, to get better, but those are kind of low level compared to true reading and understanding. Mm -hmm. so this is like a Turing test, but a different kind of Turing test. Right. Can the computer actually understand at the level of knowledge, not just symbols? Oh. And that should be tractable. I mean, one of the paradigms Microsoft go after is what's called the alter ego, where it reads things and helps you get things done. But the idea of you know, reading all the medical articles and trying to, to find uh, information, that's the one a lot of people are working on. Watson. Uh, yeah. Which would be great. It would be. <laughs> We're still waiting. Yeah, no, you get, in the next decade, I, I predict, we'll, we'll make progress on that. Okay, well, this is a synthesis of a question from a number of uh, people. Both of you, in different ways, have moved outside the traditional comfort zones of scientists to engage with broader communities. So, Francis, you've had to learn to work with presidents and politicians. You engage with businesses um, in your work. Um, Mr. Gates, you have worked with businesses. You've worked with on global health. 
Um, you've worked in education. Do you think that there's a need for scientists to be more engaged in public discourse? And if so, what is the best way for human geneticists to engage in that discourse? And do you have any advice for us all on how to get outside the science bubble? <laughs> Go ahead, Bill. Well, I think the, the, there's always this concern that people jump, like whenever you talk about AI, people jump to the control problem and don't look at the incredible benefits. I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about the control problem, but that is, uh, you know, probably lifetimes away, and, you know, there's a lot of issues and benefits that come before that. With genetics, genetics, people often jump to the uh, designer baby type question so quickly, yeah. and, you know, they don't think about, hey, sickle cell disease, uh, and, you know, what an incredible human tragedy that is, or even, as I mentioned, getting plants and livestock that, make the healthiness and nutrition of everybody in Africa, even with the challenges there, uh, dramatically better. You know, I've been, uh, a big part of my work at the foundation is meeting with uh, government leaders in Africa and talking to them about their health systems, which uh, isn't often a priority. Uh, and, you know, saying, hey, here's how you compare there are other countries at your level of wealth who do it far better than you do. And, and I've been amazed at the reception that I've had. You know, they, they're definitely interested. So uh, scientists with credibility can, or people bringing science uh, or, or measurements with credibility, can have a very uh, positive effect on things. And I actually think that's not something uh, for a scientist uh, to fear as, oh my gosh, they're going to make me talk to this particular constituency. It's actually quite satisfying if you kind of approach it with a clear idea of what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, I certainly never would have expected to spend as much of my time as I do in those kinds of conversations uh, with politicians and other constituents, um, certainly also working now a lot trying to build partnerships with advocacy organizations, with philanthropy, like this guy, uh, with, uh, with industry. Um, with the Congress, for instance, I mean, if you want to see the success of American biomedical research, the U.S. Congress is basically the place that's going to decide uh, what the resources that the federal government is going to put into this are going to look like. And I can't tell you how important it is, and when those decisions are made, uh, that the members of Congress actually have some sense about what's being done, and that it's being done not just in Bethesda, Maryland, but it's being done in every state and every district uh, around this whole country, including places that they drive by when they go home. Uh, on, on, a, on a leave from the Congress. Getting that message across and getting them to have a chance to actually talk to a scientist, maybe in their own district, who's doing an experiment they're excited about, makes all the difference. So I hope all of you who have not had the opportunity to invite your elected representatives to come to your institution and tell them what you're doing uh, will do so. It's the most important thing we can do, I think, to, to try to encourage support for all of this. Obviously, that's not the only audience. It is an important one. I've probably met with more than 400 members of the United States Congress in the last four or five years, one-on-one, -on -one, talking about an area of science that's interesting to them. I can't think of a single one of those that I walked out of thinking, oh, that went badly. It always goes well because the story is so compelling. What you all do, what we all do, is the most amazing story that they've heard that day. It's because mostly what they've heard is a lot of special interests and a lot of political things that aren't going well. And to walk in and say, let me tell you about discoveries that are happening right now that are going to potentially transform our understanding of life and have this potential to, to do something about diseases that we currently don't have answers to. They want to know about that. And then you can tell them about how this is also going to stimulate the economy in their state. There's some good statistics about that. And also how it's going to maybe bend the healthcare cost curve that they're really worried about and encourage the continued success of American biomedicine because we're such an important part of this ecosystem that involves not just public support but also private support and philanthropy. That's such a winning story. You can't lose if you sort of package that right and if you do a little homework to find out what are the interests of the person you're talking to. 
So as you can tell, I get a bang out of this. I am not, I'm not a regretful person at all when I, I have the chance to have those kinds of conversations. And I would encourage all of you, figure out who your best audience is. Now, maybe it's not a member of Congress. Maybe it's a high school that's struggling and trying to figure out how to get the right kind of life science into place. Many of you are part of DNA Day, this tech uh, effort that brings people together on April 25th, but has reverberations that go throughout the year sort of figure out that it's worth putting a few percent of your time into that. You'll get more out of it than the people you speak to, but they'll get a lot out of it too. That was my speech. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for asking. Uh, another one? So, yeah, there's, um, this is a question from a combination of uh, Ofer Karp, Kanal Sanghavi and Dekal Gelbman, a synthesis of a question. So we're kind of playing catch up to have sufficient genome interrogation of diverse human populations so that we can avoid creating new kinds of health disparities around genetics, but also recognizing is issues around health literacy and science literacy and financial access to precision medicine. How would you prioritize the activities needed to move as rapidly as possible towards what um, Mr. Gates described as really achieving the larger goal of high quality precision medicine for all? Um, and what parts of those activities do you think our society can be most helpful in, um, in achieving those goals? Um, both well, of you. I think the term precision medicine sometimes uh, is taken to the point of saying, okay, we're going to have personalized medicine and, you know, individual drugs for individual diseases. And, you know, I don't think in, you know, the next 30 or 40 years, that's the right direction to go. We still have major diseases, uh, in diabetes, Alzheimer's, the, you know, HIV, malaria, that we need to make sure the resources are, are going into those. And in terms of how you create products that you can assure safety on, uh, it would be, it will be a ch challenging problem uh, to get to that. So, you know, I still feel like there's big, big things that we need to keep our attention on. And, you know, I'm often looking at the incentive system and saying, okay, is, is cancer about the share it should be? Our orphan diseases, which got almost nothing, now are getting a lot. You know, is that uh, at that right share? So making sure the incentive system is still uh, making it attractive mm -hmm. to go after these big things, that's super important. And so the U.S. Congress not only sets the NIH budget, which is sort of the world's health research budget. Uh, I wish I could say it was a third of the world's health research budget, but it's, it's way over... Uh, half, particularly if, if weighted by effectiveness. They also set the drug pricing policies that determine uh, where those scientific discoveries are taken uh, by uh, both uh, biotech and pharma, you know, what, what things they go after and, and what they do. And although it's, you know, great to talk about tuning either of those things, it is important to acknowledge the system is in large part, working extremely well today. The, the okay. number of great companies that are being started up, the potential solutions that are coming along. Uh, and so I hope people are careful as they think about toying with either of these, uh, these things and perhaps drawing the rest of the world in to do more uh, of its share, particularly these rising middle-income countries. You know, I hope, I hope we maintain the, the positive elements we have. Yeah, I think... Precision medicine, uh, for me, does not imply that you have to sort of develop one drug for one person, but rather that if you have a menu of interventions that you try to figure out which one is going to work best for which of the many thousands of people who need that particular intervention. I was heartened by the recent publication on warfarin pharmacogenomics, showing that actually there is a compelling story here uh, that using genotyping improves outcomes in the administration of this commonly uh, prescribed drug. And there are many others, I suspect, uh, where that would be true if we had the data. 
So when you t the question, though, I think is also asking about health disparities and what about uh, the people uh, in the rest of the world, but also here uh, at home uh, who have not been the beneficiaries of some of these advances and are not the beneficiaries of the way our health care system works. Uh, I think one of the things that we as researchers, and that's, I guess, the hat that I'm pretty much required to wear, I can't fix uh, some of the other aspects of what's wrong with our health care. But as far as research, we really should be in everything we're doing, paying attention to this issue about underrepresented groups and have we in fact reached out and been welcoming to them, both in terms of being participants in research and being part of our workforce. When I come to this meeting, I'm always reminded that we have a ways to go in terms of the diversity of people that we have made it seem attractive to come and work in the field of human genetics. We're still way short of where we need to be if we were going to be taking full advantage of the power that a diverse workforce in terms of its team effort has been clearly shown to demonstrate. And likewise, in our participation, we are a lot better than we used to be in terms of research participation by groups that are not the majority. Uh, but we could do better. In this regard, I have to give a quick commercial then for all of us, uh, this um, unprecedented program that is underway right now in a beta test mode uh, to enroll a million Americans in a longitudinal prospective cohort study that will involve collection of biospecimens as well as electronic health records, lots of personal information that they will record, wearable sensors that they will walk around with. This is going to be a massively interesting data set and it's going to be set up so that qualified researchers can have a look at it. Coming back to Pete's question about how do we make sure we set this up in a way that it empowers everybody, this is going to be done that way. And the participants are going to be at the table. But importantly, we have made a commitment that at least 50% of the participants in that study are going to be from underrepresented groups. And that means not just race and ethnicity, but also socioeconomic status, uh, also people from rural communities who tend not to get in, invited to these studies. So watch this space. When this launches, which is expected to happen right now in about April, uh, there will be an opportunity to bring all kinds of folks into this tent, uh, which we think is a pretty exciting one, uh, and a lot of people that you maybe haven't seen before because we haven't engaged with them, and now we think it's time. And maybe out of that, uh, we will fill in some of the missing pieces about health disparities. But if we really want to get there in terms of precision medicine and having inequities taken care of, it's going to have to deal with reimbursement. And right now, the pathway between knowing that something can improve outcomes and getting agreement that it's going to be paid for is not as direct as it might be. And for genomics, we still don't even have that. For some cases, you would think, for instance, cancer, uh, where the evidence is pretty compelling, and yet in many instances, third parties are not paying for it. So One this more is... question. <laughs> So this is a question uh, specifically for you, Bill. So um, infectious disease and preterm birth, these are things you mentioned uh, that are obviously a big priority for the, for the Gates Foundation. But what else is on the priority list? I mean, what's, you know, what's, what's really on your mind uh, as, as sort of the next, the next big thing that needs to be addressed in addition to these? Well, we, we're driven by the health equity. And uh, so, you know, still that means our biggest areas are uh, HIV, uh, TB, malaria, and those first 30 days. And I'm very hopeful that as we make progress on those things, that uh, we can find the places where the U.S. health system and, and other wealthy countries have come up with really great interventions. And then it's a challenge to us to say, okay, how, what is the marginal cost? How would you have to change that? Uh, with the vaccine manufacturers or the HIV drug manufacturers, it's worked out super well that they literally uh, make it available to the poorest countries at, at the marginal price. And then we go in and provide uh, the fixed cost to develop the processes. We go in and make volume guarantees. And that in the vaccine market has changed it from being one where uh, the vaccines usually take 30 years between when they're available in the U.S. to when they're getting to Africa, to now, uh, literally, uh, pneumococcus uh, was only a few years difference. HPV, we have 
one country in Africa that's actually ahead of the U.S. in terms of <laughs> using HPV vaccine. Uh, Rwanda. Uh, exactly. Uh, <laughs> now they're good at a lot of things. Uh, okay. So it's get, scaling that up will be a challenge. But it's interesting that the, you know that's one where the U.S. Uh, hasn't totally cracked the code of high uh, 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 usage rates. And so, you know, I'm very much hoping that there will be interventions for uh, take uh, diabetes and Alzheimer's, which are so widespread and will be such a problem uh, for these health systems. Uh, you know, if the middle-income countries can innovate, that's great. Then our, we see our role as taking it from the middle-income down to the poor countries. So we're going to be scanning. You know, there are things like how um, uh, uh, eye uh, surgery is done, uh, where India actually created a very high-volume, low-cost uh, model. Uh, even for heart surgery, you know, it looks like. Uh, they've maintained very high quality through using these high volume operations. So I think we'll find inspirations from all over the world. Uh, and it'll always be good news when we can take something like polio and say, okay, we had a $400 million a year budget uh, for polio. And now yeah. that budget is, is the same as our smallpox budget, which we never had to spend any money on that because people before us uh, got got rid of the disease. So that, you know, we'll celebrate all those things that we can move beyond and, and then, uh, you know, we'll find the next thing that, that really makes sense in, in health equity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder, uh, you mentioned TB, but we didn't really get into it. If I sort of look across the landscape here of things where we're making progress and things where we're really struggling, TB worries me uh, with the advent of additional sort of examples of multi-drug resistant uh, strains coming out and an occasional sort of introduction of a new therapeutic, a lot of struggling with vaccines, and yet here is a disease which is clearly far from being vanquished in any part of the world, although we don't think about it so much. Um, what should we be doing with TB that we're not doing? What, what are we missing here? <clears throat> well, there's... And TB... I'm very optimistic about uh, good TB diagnostic, either a blood or urine test, which makes a huge difference because if you can catch somebody early, then uh, you put them under treatment and they're, infection, they're uh, infecting a lot less people. So you're really bringing that R0 down. Mm -hmm. Also with TB, we have latent disease. And if you haven't a huge amount of latent disease, eventually you're going to have a lot of people with TB. China is an exemplar on TB. They, uh, 10 years ago, did not do a good job. Uh, they put resources into it, and they're bringing the TB rate down pretty substantially, mm -hmm. but it won't go away completely because uh, they'll have people, the latent disease that's there, unless we come away to treat, that will come out. The drug pipeline the second piece also looks very good. Uh, and that's in a partnership with pharma companies, uh, in a new compounds. The goal is to have a regime that is so novel that no existing TB is resistant to it. So it's a, a new three drug, drug regime uh, that I absolutely think in the next decade that we'll get that. The dream would be to have a vaccine, uh, but uh, and the genetic tools are going to help us a lot with this one because we're always so confused with TB. Do we want the immune system to do more or do we want the immune system to do less? This is a pathogen that has evolved together with the immune system. That's the most preserved part of the TB is the way it interacts with macrophages. And, you know, so it gets this privileged compartment. And the heterogeneity of the disease, uh, the improvement in the disease models, I can't say whether we have a vaccine, but I do think uh, even compared to, say, HIV, we're in much better shape because the drug pipeline looks promising and it's not a lifelong disease. In fact, the regimen, uh, if we can get the right measurement tools, the regimens could go down to two or three months. Grant. Well, I want to thank all of you for your attention and the questions that you sent to us. I want to thank the Gates Foundation, the NIH, and the society uh, staff who helped coordinate and organize all of the activity around this. I had a blast um, working with this. 
I want to thank Francis um, for taking time to attend your home meeting. And oh, yeah. It's, it's always great to be pleasure. back with my peeps. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to have you and to get to talk science with Francis. And it was a pleasure to have you, Mr. Gates. We thank you for um, your activities in science and on behalf of global health. And also for the the many of us who were nerds and science geeks way before it was cool, thank you for helping to make it a lot more cool for all of us. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Great. Good job. Yeah, right. Excellent. Thank, thank you. you. Great. Excellent. Thanks, Francis, so much.